Greetings, retrogrades and parish orphans out there. Dave and Tim Gordon here with you this lovely afternoon. I guess this will be broadcasting on a Monday, so happy Monday to everybody. Today we are pleased to be joined by a special guest, Mr. Joseph Chambra, who is, among many other uh, Catholic credentials, is a contributor to LifeSite News and most recently author of this book, Disordered, uh, really good book. We're going to be talking about it some today, and we'll be talking, I think, more about your piece on LifeSite, your most recent piece there. Joseph, how are you doing today? Good. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Hi, Dave. Hi. Thanks for coming on, Joseph. We appreciate thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We haven't done too many all Californian shows because you're in, you're in Napa Valley. Uh, people want to see a, a glass of wine in hand when you're there, and we're in Bakersfield. People want to see... Uh, I guess us doing meth or something, which is all just associated <laughs> with Bakersfield. In our trailers while like uh, swimming in our doughboy pools. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. We're not in Oildale, people. This is not 93308. But anyway, you're in a slightly fancier, uh, more prestigiously regarded zone. Uh, Joseph, how are you doing? How's, how's life? Good. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Not bad. Thank you. We corresponded briefly, uh, you know, I think around this time last year uh, when, when I was still um, working with uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall with the TNT, and I've always, you know, admired LifeSite News. I've I found uh, a few different pieces over the recent years authored by yourself, and um, most recently I, I wanted to talk to you about something that is relevant particularly to us Californians and really relevant to the church uh, universal because it's the largest sea in the United States, Los Angeles, largest sea in the country, one of the largest seas in the world. And your piece regarding the LA Religious Education Conference, which just wrapped up uh, less than a week ago, February 21, 22, 23, um, it's called The Priest Who Painted Sodomite Christ to Exhibit Artwork at Huge LA religious conference and of course you wrote this a priori you know before the beginning of the the religious education conference and it was in fact um this this artist's uh work was featured in the um in the arena lobby and what a disgrace what what do, what do you think I, oh i wasn't surprised at all i mean i've, I've been going to the la rec for the past few years the uh, if people don't know what the the LA Rec is, it is the yeah. largest Catholic gathering in the United States. So it's got I think they say sixty sixty five thousand people um, attend. A lot of CCD teachers, DREs, Catholic school teachers are actually required to go. Yes, um, whether they want to go or not. So um, you can they have literally hundreds of sessions or classes, presentations to, to go to. Um, and then you, you choose. You choose which ones you want to go to. And I had always I had heard about the rec for a long time. So, um, and I had started, um, well, I'm, I'm going backwards. I'm sorry, Tim. But I had started researching the issue of homosexuality in the Catholic Church. Not so much... Uh, in terms of predation or the the pre-sex scandal, but LGBT ministries in the church, because we had one here in San Francisco. And I, I had always just wondered how they got away with what they were doing, because uh, what they taught had nothing to do with the Catholic Church and what the Catholic right. Church teaches about homosexuality. So um, I started doing just research into it, and I found that kind of a nexus of this whole network of LGBT Catholic ministries around the United States and even around the world was at the LA Rec. Because hmm. um, a lot of the, the big names or the well-known names speak there on the LGBT issue. So I started going and I was, I was, I don't want to say I was shocked, but I was just surprised that that, that sort of blatant, disregard for catholic teaching was was going on and then i i uh specifically um 
went in 2018 because James Martin was there um, right after he had published Building right. a Bridge. And he was one of the, um, he wasn't a keynote speaker, but he was one of the featured presenters. So he was in a, you know, a very large auditorium and it was, it was fairly full. And I went to go hear him and uh, it was, it was pretty much what was in his book, but it's, it, he went into a lot more detail because he had um uh, uh what do you call it an overhead projection or a um what do you call slide that show. Yeah, like a slide powerpoint show. yeah powerpoint thank you the powerpoint and um he's from new york city so he was touting all of the uh, lgbt ministries there like out of saint paul and the one at his home parish at saint ignatius right which, the stuff that they have been promoting is is not catholic it's it's it, to to kind of condense his teaching into one point um or maybe just a couple of points he maintains that you're born gay god made you gay god doesn't make junk in his own words and and therefore the teachings of the catholic church are flawed and they're developing and the way they're going to develop is because because God would not make somebody intrinsically disordered. God would not make somebody with a propensity towards evil, which is what the homosexual condition is, and um, according to the Catechism, and right. um, he says that the way that the church is going to develop, or uh, uh, um, will eventually accept homosexuality, is by this sort of interaction between the church. And, and gay people and the LGBT community, specifically, you know, the hierarchy and LGBT people. So that's the whole building a bridge thing. And um, that's how I really started looking at the wreck. And I, and I always look at it every single year. And then this year they had um, this Jesuit McNichols. And I, 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 had, I had heard of him because I, <laughs> because I kind of know all the players in the Catholic LGBT world, and, and I had heard of him quite a few times. Right. I had actually written a piece about him because uh, James Martin had recommended uh, a book that McNichols, his work was, was in. And I, William Hart McNichols is the author's, uh, the artist's name. I, I didn't say him at the top of the show, but it's yeah. William Hart McNichols. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's really it. bad stuff. It's frightening stuff. Yeah, and, and he's come out as as gay, and um, he's there's kind of a weird. And I'm taking a deep dive to him. There's kind of a weird world within the Catholic LGBT world, and that's kind of the world of queer theology. And he's very much involved in that, which is a very homoerotic Christ, and um, it, it gets pretty sick. If you, so he is involved in that, um, that particular, and so they displayed his work at the REC, which, you know, I, I've, I've looked at a lot of his work, he's done like, he's not a bad painter, I don't think he's extraordinary, but um, he, he did like a, a, a painting of um, Matthew Shepard as an icon, Matthew Shepard, the, the, yeah. the, the you know, Texas. Murder. yeah, yeah. yeah. I've looked everywhere. I can't find what the title of the, the painting or paintings are that were actually featured at the arena lobby at this year's religious <gasps> education conference, uh, February 2020. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's presumptively, it is in innocuous, right? So we want to say this real clear for people that the so-called, you know, the nicknamed Sodomite Christ painting or, or series of paintings were not featured at the religious education conference, but we were talking before we ran tape, and this would be similar to you know the sanction, the sanctioning authority of the you know largest diocese in the United States, featuring the Piss Christ or something like this, right? Except the Sodomite Christ is far more uh, blasphemous uh, than even the Piss Christ, arguably. And so, yeah, it's the author of that work, and it's it's presumably one of his, his less offensive um, visual works. Right, right. And it would be, yeah, I can't remember the, uh, the was that Alessandro Saranelli? It would be like his work, but not that particular work. 
being displayed at the LA Rec. And it's right. But if if you look at the larger picture there of the Rec, you have James Martin. You had uh, an out gay Jesuit displaying his artwork, and then you have several other gay activists who are speaking at the Rec, and then the official ministry and there's a long story behind that why there's an official lgbt ministry in la the catholic ministry for lesbian and gay persons cmlgp they have a display there with the rainbow flag oddly enough or not oddly enough it was stationed this year right next to the scouting booth so that was the booth where the the boy scouts and the girl scouts had their booth and yeah. next to it, you had the rainbow flag and the trans flag, which is some people might, it's, it's sort of, it's uh, alternating colors of pink and blue. And so they had the, the trans flag there. Well, let's, so, yeah, that's, think about this from center for a moment. There are people out there, and I, I mean, I know you, you can get there, you can imagine this because you've been gone after Joseph, but there are people when uh, Taylor Marshall and I were doing, uh, uh, the lion's share of our TNT shows on Archbishop Vigano and, you know, the sexual abuse crisis, having this homosexualist center in the church. And Pope Francis saying, I will not say one word. The world media, the global press took the dog whistle cue and did not press any further when he was, he, he was all but uh, implicated in the, uh, in the cover up of the Uncle Ted McCarrick, Summer of Shame, he said, I won't say one word. No one, he still hasn't said one word about it. And he's been off scot-free. What I want to say, and and what I'd like you to talk about is, because you mentioned it, where's the protection come from these people? I mean, call me a conspiracy theorist now, right? This is the largest diocese. They're featuring uh, a a gay artist, ex-Jesuits art, and like half of, not half, a third of the topics in the breakout groups, I've been to these things, are on queer theology. And come on, like what you're going to call me a conspiracy theorist? It's nuts, right? Where does the sanction come from? Who's responsible for this? It's a, it's a, it's a fairly tangled web. And what I've been able to gather is that um, several uh, religious orders... I mean, primarily the Jesuits, I would say, because if you go to what I've been able to determine is if you go to every Jesuit parish in a large city, um, let's just take St. Agnes and St. Ignatius in San Francisco. They both, well, not St. Ignatius, because that's um, connected with the University of San Francisco, but I'm getting on a tangent. But the University of San Francisco has a, has a very open LGBT ministry. And then at St. Agnes in San Francisco, they, they, are, they have an LGBT ministry. And then St. Ignatius in New York City has a, has a very, very uh, uh, well-developed and, and you know, uh, out there LGBT ministry. So you have the Jesuits involved. Then you have the Paulist Fathers involved who, who have an LGBT ministry. In New York, right? Is yeah. That in New York? yeah. Yeah. Then you have the Marianists involved. They have an LGBT ministry. And then the Franciscan um, Friars of the Holy Name Province, they have several uh, uh, LGBT ministries at, at their parishes. But then some diocesan parishes, like St. Monica's and Santa Monica, has a very large LGBT parish. And uh, Most Holy Redeemer in San Francisco has a very uh, large LGBT ministry at the parish. So sometimes it's diocesan, sometimes it's um, connected to religious orders. Um, what happened in, in that document, um, I know I'm going too slow here. And usually it's the, you're saying usually if it's a religious order, it's the Jezbos, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, there used to be a group called Dignity, and yeah. um, they were having gay masses at a lot of parishes. There was a very well-known one in, in Seattle back in the 80s. And yeah. then there was that 86 um, document from um, Cardinal Ratzinger at the, uh, at the um, which, what was the, 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 uh, the department he used to be the head of? 
Oh, yeah. Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Right, the Congregation. So they released this document in 86, and it didn't mention dignity by name or any parish by name, but it told bishops that they were no longer to have these gay masses at the parish. So what a lot of religious orders did, and a lot of bishops did that were very tricky, they kind of performed a sleight of hand, where in, instead of having all these, these gay masses and gay ministries under the dignity umbrella, they kind of chopped them up and started their own um, d uh, ministries. Like in L.A., Mahoney started the CMLGP, the, uh, the Catholic Ministry for Lesbian and Gay Persons. So if you go to the L.A. Archdiocese website, you know, they have their own page. Yeah. And that group is, is really all controlled and populated by gay activists. Hmm. And, um, well, it has emboldened these people to do this, you know, because obviously you have the clear Catholic teaching on, on, on this hand. And on the other hand, you have this kind of navigation, this slippery serpentine navigation of it and, and to try and kind of squeeze something that isn't a real fit into, um, you know, a hole not made for it, I guess. I've, sp I've spoken with bishops about these ministries, and uh, they won't do anything. They're afraid. I mean, I've actually spoken to Gomez. I guess it was in 2017. I was there at the, at the rec, and um, I took sort of like a dossier on each one of these LGBT speakers and I, I talked to him, I cornered him, I didn't corner him, but I, he was being interviewed and I waited and I talked to him. He was quite nice and quite gracious. And um, I just said, Archbishop, these are the speakers that you are, have here and these are what they have said. And he didn't do anything. He hasn't done anything. Those people. What did he still, say? What did he say? Because, I mean, the, you know, the defenders of, of these guys, it sounds like the answer to your question is the, the hierarchy. The hierarchy is how they're doing it. These guys are all bought, paid for, protected by the hierarchy. What was his answer? I, I'm curious because he's, Archbishop Gomez is, is touted as a uh, conservative oh. bishop. I, I don't know. Right, yeah. and when you're a bishop, they can't do anything to you. You're a bishop. You're a prince, you know. You're a, a, a successor to the apostles. There's no can't do anything to you what they have no leverage a priest um when i went home a priest from the archdiocese did call me um because he was directed by archbishop gomez to do that and and we talked i don't know for 45 minutes and nothing was resolved nothing i just said why are these people there why are they speaking there um but and, what did and, Archbishop Gomez say to you, uh, Joseph, when you said, "Hey, what's the deal, Leo?" <laughs> you know, he said that no, he said nothing. He said nothing. Stonewalled you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, that's. I mean, so it was literally like, "Hey, why do we have so much gay stuff happening at a Jesuit? Uh, uh, sorry, at a Roman Catholic uh, religious education conference?" And he just like blinked at you. They, 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 well, no, bishops just tend to play dumb. I think they don't. You know. Hear, hear, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. They just don't, they just don't do it. They just what our listeners and our viewers scandal. have to understand is that, <laughs> is that bishops in their own see, within, within a see, a bishop is the sovereign, um, you know, it, when it comes to prudential judgment calls and whatnot. So they are, this is, the, he, the, that's, and particularly an archbishop, that is the topmost uh, juridical authority. So the, the, the only explanation I have is why they don't clamp down, and I, I've seen it in San Francisco and in L.A., which both of those bishops tend to be regarded not as liberals, let's put it that way. Right. Not as liberal. The only th thing that I can figure out is that they don't clamp down on it because they would have a revolt from a lot of their presbytery, which is gay. I but, just don't see what there is a, to, to be afraid of. But, There's a revolt but, without teeth. Then we get all of these bad priests out of there. It's like, fine, you want to leave the ministry? That's better. It's better to have a shortage of priests in the short term than to have these wolves in sheep's clothing feeding trash to their flocks, right? And this is, the, this is what the bishops need to have as their mindset. It doesn't right. matter if people, if we're a little shorthanded for a while. What matters is that 
are the faithful aren't being led astray by evil priests. They, they, I agree with you, Dave, but I had this conversation with a bishop about a particular parish, and the, the, the particular parish is so toxic that I just feel, especially for the LGBT community, I just feel that it would be so much better if the, if the parish was closed. And yeah. that is not what bishops will do. They will do anything to keep a parish open, even if it, and I've used the analogy of a hospital that has a history of uh, botched surgeries, people being killed by um, uh, people, by uh, doctors that are negligent, there's been lawsuits, but you keep the hospital open and you keep the people going in and they're still being uh, disfigured and murdered and killed. That's just right. the way they see it. They don't think like you do. Yeah, let's shut the hospital down. Get rid of these doctors, these surgeons that are all corrupt and complicit with each other. And let's just hire new people. Well, the they, question they, they the won't question do, is they won't do what, it. I don't want to. I don't want to put you. I was. I was about to say well, what. Okay, what percentage do you think? The real question. If we're to sort this out, it will be sorted out in a hundred years or, or whatever. You know, fifty. I don't know when. Is what portion percentage portion of the episcopate is gay, you know, is gay, is gay friendly, homosexualist and practicing gay. What portion of the presbyterate is practicing, you know, not just homosexualist, but homosexual gay? What portion of whatever the diaconate? Yeah. So, I mean, th th these are the it, numbers that. Yeah the, yeah. the answer I give Tim is it depends on the diocese and it depends on the religious order. I would say the Jesuits, it's really high and the Paulists, it's really high. And I would say the Archdiocese of San Francisco, L.A., New York, it's pretty high. And now, when you say now, high, let's, uh, let, can you parse that out a little bit? Because high for me would be one in a million in the church. You just shouldn't oh. have people with these well. proclivities. Obviously, I know I'm not. Okay, Rip Van Winkle. That's what it is. Yeah. I'm just saying, can you give an idea to the, uh, to the listeners of what high is? Is it one in 20, one in 50, two I would say, in four? You know, not a majority, but close to a majority. Oh, the Jesuits is not a majority. I, I've heard. I've heard what happened to the Jesuits. Oh, oh it's, then, a, yeah. it's a strong majority, don't you? Yeah, I'd say so. I thought. I, I thought they're well over fifty yeah. percent. I, I thought they're completely infiltrated. I, and the Paulists. I don't even. I don't even have any, an association with them. That's not just a homosexualist uh, sort of front group. Um, it is. These guys are gun runners for LGBT. That's that's what. Happened to the Jesuits, the Paulists, the, uh, the, the, the one Franciscan order, you know, the, the, I forget what, there's so many Franciscans, but uh, one of them, it's just like, this is how, I mean, Our Lady of Good Success said that the, the priesthood would be infiltrated and with strong inf um, insinuations that it would be a sexual kind of corruption they, in the second half of the 20th they century. They had taken over the seminaries as well. I mean, if you look at the rector, I mean, one of the good things, I mean, Bishop, Archbishop Corleone has done some good things in San Francisco. And one of the good things he has tried to do is clean up St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park because it was very bad. I mean, the rector there who he got, well, he got rid of all the Sulpicians that were there. They had pretty much controlled that seminary for a long time. And a, a big part of the problem was the rector that was there and he, he got rid of him. So I think that place has, has cleaned up quite a bit. I mean, I knew a priest that was there at the time, and he would call me on the phone, and it was it was horrifying. It was back in the early O's. And he wow. would tell me the stuff that was going on there. I was like, Father, I don't know, grin and bear it. I, I don't know, grit your teeth. He was just trying to get through. Secret. You know, they used to call Mundelein the Pink Palace because of its reputation for open homoeroticism among its seminarians. It's horrifying that these things are abided. And I guess my take on a lot of this, and I think kind of a theme for the show, is that the faithful need to stop taking it. There's things you can do, acts of ecclesial civil disobedience. So what I would call for, and by the way, again, I apologize for like hacking up along here. I've been kind of off on the side coughing. I just, for whatever reason, I've, I've gotten hit with a couple flus this season. So I'm working through it. Uh, keep me in your prayers. Um, civil disobedience. If you're in a parish um, where this stuff is going on, this sort of treachery, this uh, gay skullduggery, you know, where they're having these 
uh, pride masses or if it's not a, a pride mass, you know, a gay ministry, show up there. Show up with a sign. Unplug the microphone. God's law is higher than man's law. So if you know of things like this, we need a pack mama moment with, uh, what was the guy's name, Tishigil? I, I'm not sure of the pronunciation. Tishigil, yeah, Tishigil. Yeah. Where you're throwing pack into the river. If you see a rainbow flag at your parish, rip it down, burn it in front of the parish. That's what I'd say to do. And, and again, uh, don't fear the consequences. We're going to have to answer to Christ one day. We're going to have to look Christ in the face as he judges us. And he's going to say, why did you do nothing? You know, we're told on the face of Scripture that, we're going to have to answer for every idle word, every idle deed that we did. I don't want to look at my Lord and say, I did nothing in the face of this treachery, this skullduggery that is afoot in the church. I want to go down as a soldier for Christ. And remember, that's an effect of the sacrament of confirmation. It turns you into a soldier of Christ, which is why the, the bishop actually used to slap people in the face lightly when they were getting the sacrament. Uh, it was because it was preparing one to be a soldier of Christ. And it, sh- it infuses us with the graces necessary to be a martyr, white or red. So acts of civil ecclesial disobedience. Um, you, it, if you see gay artwork, like we were talking about, like that is the headline of this show, right? At these conferences, at these diocesan conferences. Well, the work actually- itself wasn't, wasn't gay. I mean, right. it, this, right. is, this is how they operate kind of hiding in plain sight is, is the artworks that, that are not uh, openly, uh, you know, homosexualist, uh, blasphemous artworks of, of, of Jesus as a, a gay man. But it's the artist, and it's it features, I'd imagine, one of his more banal, um, right. you know, beyond reproach paintings. That's how they operate. So yeah. it's got, this is what makes people take pause and say, "Oh, well, I would be. I'm I'm willing to rip down a blasphemous artwork. I'm ready to do it right now." But it's like the artwork I, of a of a bad artist. What do I do with that? It 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 to people that know, it sends a message what the LA rec is doing. Okay, James Martin, Arthur Fitzmaurice, uh, Father Brian Massengale, uh, Chris Ponnet, all of these people, and then uh, McNichols with the paintings. It's sending a message. It's saying, hey, we don't care what any of you think about church teaching or whatever. This is the way, this is the direction we're going and try to stop us. I, I was very personally insulted because I had spoke to um, Bishop Archbishop Gomez, and uh, I had spoken to that priest and, and told him about my situation yeah. as being a, a, a priest sex abuse survivor and how I was personally, I don't want to say traumatized because then I sound like a victim, but I was personally offended by a lot of the presentations at the yeah. rec, t- telling people who have same-sex attraction that you were born gay, that God made you gay, there's nothing wrong with this, there's nothing wrong with your feelings, and all right. this stuff. And I was like, you know what, I was molested as a kid. I don't think that molestation was part of God's plan in any way at all. And I think, you know, over 70% of gay men have been molested by somebody of the same sex. Only 7% of heterosexual men have been molested by someone of the same sex. So I think that molestation had a lot to do with why I was later gay. So you got these priests up there telling me that I was born gay, and I, I was offended by it, and I, and I told him about that. Well, what did they do the following year? They added James Martin onto the roster of the LGBT speakers. And I was like, you know what? They don't, yeah. they don't care. That's that's yeah. Well, you, from the cry, the, the sincere cry of the heart of one of their most ardently faithful uh, sons of the church, who's struggled with this, uh, struggled out of it, you know, to 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 be SSA, not calling yourself gay, and to have uh, to have read your account or, and parts of it in disordered. It's that's that's genuinely touching that you would as a. I mean, there's a kind of second woundedness that all of us are facing. So many of us are, are you know, running around dealing with, fa- I mean, I'm using the uh, royal us here, with kind of father abandonment. You know, Benedict XVI talks about it. We live in the age of absconding fathers, tr- crisis of fatherhood, by our genetic biological fathers or whatever. 
And then you're like, okay, but you know, I can turn to my ecclesial uh, church father, and this is what you're doing, and you explain your situation. I'm Joseph Chambra. This is kind of this is kind of a mini apostolate that I've developed in an attempt to be faithful. I have a, um, I'm, I'm thinking particularly profoundly about chapter eight, your terror of demons chapter, where you talk about the Josephite moment, where you you turn to the Saint Joseph statue that you admired uh, that your dad had in his room, and you're denied. I mean, what, what what is one to say? This is this is pathetic and heartbreaking that you're you know denied by your spiritual fathers when you from the plea of your heart you make the appeal. Please help me. Why will they not help men like you or men like us who sincerely want something done about this, Joseph? I don't know why. I even told Bishop Gomez. I said, you know, Bishop Gomez. I'll be, I'll try to be flexible. I'm not going to tell you to run these people out of here, although I, I think they shouldn't speak there. I mean, they wouldn't have people from Planned Parenthood speak at the LA Rec. And I said, you know, have someone from the, with a different point of view. Have somebody there, have one person. I mean, the whole the card is stacked on the other side with just multiple speakers that uh, are, go against church teaching. Have one. They wouldn't even do that. Right, they, they a, and it's a clear it up. You got to at least, and I don't think that's sufficient. I don't think you can just be like, "Oh, we'll even abide evil as long as we have offsetting no. good." But like, yeah, I see your I point. Like you know, like, no, no, no. It, it's I, I was willing to give point. him a mile if he would just give me a millimeter. <laughs> so what that shows me is that there is a cabal with serious power, with even you know a soft coercive power, because as Tim said. The bishop in his diocese is head honcho. No one judges a bishop in his diocese. That He is the supreme monarch of his diocese. So that means that in the church, there's people either through um, the financial kind of a prodding, uh, a financial bayonet can affect some kind of, I guess, what would you call it, retribution against dioceses that stand strong on this issue or some other kind of coercion. But we need to figure out what that is. It's or, or, or just, I mean, judging by history, just many of those implicated in the cover-ups and the sex abuse themselves are, are bishops. When there's a monarch who is um, pushing in, in his own little sovereign jurisdiction, even if it's a little city monarchy like Luxembourg, and you know, you see gay flags everywhere, and the monarch is is standing idly by and and watching this happen. I'm not just talking about Los Angeles. I'm talking about every every place where a religious education conference happens, and it's got gay stuff everywhere. You think the monarch is pro gay for either a personal right, or ideological reason? All reports are that a guy like Archbishop Gomez is pretty strongly conservative, or at least conservative on these no. issues and is not personally pro-gay. That's what I'm saying is there must be some soft coercive power or hard coercive power at work here. Well, I don't, I don't think those are the reports. I mean, I, I've heard reports uh, every which way on all these bishops, but this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, is it not, Joseph? I mean, this is how we tell. Pope Francis has said he's pro-abortion, anti-abortion, pro this, pro that. I mean, you find out, you judge them by their feet, right? By their deeds. And so I, I've heard ever, I've heard tons of stuff about all these bishops. For better. I'm a, yeah, I'm a one-issue guy. This is the only issue that, that I focus on. There's very few bishops, I mean, Bishop Pepperaki, Bishop Strickland, but they're yeah. in very small dioceses. I don't think they have an issue. I, I wish Bishop Pepperaki was in L.A., but I'm sure he doesn't have a lot of gay priests in, in Rockford, Illinois. And I don't think he would tolerate it if he knew it. Um, and I don't, he wouldn't tolerate an LGBT ministry with no. flying the rainbow flag and using the rainbow flag on the altar during Mass. I, I just know he wouldn't. I, I've spoken to him. He's a good, good man. Yeah, but, yes. I'd love, I'd love to talk to him. I really admire that. that. There's a spiritual father, you know. But we, why, don't, why don't, I mean, the question isn't, why, why are we tripping over ourselves to, to um, exculpate the, the ones, the lineal descendants of the apostles who Jesus himself, our blessed Lord, told us, 
these are the ones that if they're a stumbling block, if they become a stumbling block to the little ones, they have the most guilt on their heads. Totally. Um, so it doesn't matter. I mean, if, if you... The if, onus is on them. I mean, right. Tim, I mean, it's it's been a hard realization. I mean, I've been involved with this fight for 20 years. I came back to the church in 1999. Um, they don't... I don't know. The bishops covered up one of the most... Or, the bishops covered up the most heinous crime that I can think of, which is the sexual molestation of a child. So, of course, they're going to cover up um, LGBT people being confused and deceived. Right. And, right. I mean, that's that's like minor for them. That's like jaywalking compared right, which is... to, to the other stuff, the other nasty stuff. I mean, when I came back to the church, I, I got involved in all this sex scandal stuff right away. It's a long story. It's in my book. But I was involved with a religious order that was abusing children and underage teenage boys and oh it was bad it, it was really bad that the, it's a good point though it's a good it point. falls on the laity then it's incumbent on the laity to do something of and course. to put tremendous tremendous it's very pressure on that because i mean the majority of catholics catholics whoever they are they approve of, of gay marriage and there was a pew a pew survey done that Two thirds of younger Catholics approve of of gay marriage, so it's very difficult to get any traction on this. I mean, you can get traction. I mean, there are liberal dice, liberal parishes that have very pro gay LGBT ministries, and they also have a pro life ministry. So, I mean, you can get people on board with the pro life issue. It's very hard to get them with the gay one. We need yeah, a I mean, few good at, men, few good men at each parish, and then they need to to take action. You know, they like I said, civil ecclesial disobedience. So if you see this nonsense happening at your parish, you need to take a few good men, and you need to stand up to the priest. But those, and that might mean but, unplugging a microphone on James Martin and right. be, getting, Dave, getting Dave. Those people that would do that are not at those parishes. They're not at St. Monica's in, in St. Monica. They're not at Most Holy Redeemer. They're not at um, St. Paul the Apostle in New York. They're not there. But unfortunately, and, and my heart has always been with the LGBT community, because these parishes and these ministries are near the gay ghettos, they're near the Castro, they're near West Hollywood, they're near Chelsea. Well, Manhattan is a big gay ghetto. But, you know, they, um, the, the very, 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 very few gay people are interested in Catholicism. Very few, minuscule. But if you, you know, once in a blue moon, one of them, for whatever reason, will trip into a Catholic church, they'll, they'll go into one of these, these parishes. Yeah. So, um, I, I'd like to offer a synthetic moment to synthesize. I, I mean, I always like acts of civil disobedience. So I, I think do what Dave's saying. Maybe maybe with with a duty incumbent, um, depending on whether or not this is happening during a liturgy, then it just becomes oh, a, sure. a a position of, of of defending our Lord at the liturgy at the consecration with the gay flag. You got to get that out there. That's there's demonic. Pride, so maybe cross masses, town. There's pride masses across the country every June. Go to a different parish. Yeah, go to go to one of these parishes and do it. But here here's the point that I'm I'm kind of I'm I'm synthesizing what Dave's saying with what you're saying, Joseph. It's I mean, if you if a kid comes to school and he's a kindergartner, right, and and he's saying openly racist things, you go to his father and you know, okay, the, the father's a, a real, like a real racist, right? Because because the, the kindergartner wouldn't have picked this up. So the question that I think Joseph is coming back to, that I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not saying either or. I'm saying both and. Dave is. How seriously do you take the idea of spiritual fatherhood of the bishops? I mean, this is what sometimes show to show maybe where we approach it from a somewhat different angle. It's like, dude, I don't care whether or not they're, uh, the bishops are gay themselves, which is some of them, whether they have gay friends, which is a lot of them, or whether they're good but afraid of the gays, which I think is some of them too, maybe a minority. I don't know what. It doesn't matter. The onus, like joseph said is on them and we shouldn't be surprised that the laity if we really are the spiritual uh you know um progeny of these spiritual fathers are parroting back crap about oh well, you can be gay and be catholic if the if this is truly what's getting waterfall down from the spiritual fathers how seriously do we take 
the, the you know, the spiritual uh, parentage of the faith. And I would say if we take it as seriously as we purport to, yeah. and we take Jesus' words as seriously as we do, man, these it really more of the onus is on the bishops. You can r- rip down a, ma- uh, a flag, I'm all for that, but that's not going to really do anything aside it, from save Jesus from being profaned. You know what? In the beginning, when I started speaking out on this issue, I really thought I could make a difference. But the Catholic Church is a top-down organization. Um, I mean, like you said earlier, Tim, the bishop in his diocese is like a prince. So it, the bishop has got to do it. If he won't, you can scream, you can yell, you can tear up rainbow flags, or like that that very saintly priest in um, Chicago who had the priest burn, burn, burn the flag. What does that do? The AGLO, which is the uh, the LGBT ministry there in Chicago, is just as strong as ever. And um, the gay parishes there in Boys Town and, and Chicago are still doing the same thing. Right. It, it's got to be the bishop. It's got to be the bishop. Right. It's, but what I'm funny. saying is that under this theory of there's bishops kind of capitulating to this, what they see as a popular demand in the church, this soft coercion. So it's a dialectic. You have your, you have your thesis, then you have your an- antithesis, and then there's a synthesis. If the antithesis is the only thing that exists in the church, and there's not the thesis. You, you've got to drive the narrative to the right. You've got to drive the sentiments of the church to the right. And if you have a robust lay involvement from the faithful, as contemplated in like Gaudium et Space, right? The bishops actually kind of delegate this role. They say, this is partly the role of the laity, is to form the church. Okay, then that's fine. Let's have the lay faithful give some pushback. Because right now, you've just got kind of a thesis being pushed, right? If we're looking at it the right way from the church, I'm not a homosexuality is outside of the church, if it's since it's not allowed, since it's evil, since we know that. Now, let's call it the antithesis. You have this antithesis that's just being pushed all day, and it's getting no pushback from the faithful. Well, of course, it's going to lurch the church and the consciousness within the church to the left. If we have pushback, then that's going to push back on the soft coercion that the bishops are having, and that's going to at least center them. If no, Now, we want to com- make them fully in the right, right? We want them to have full orthodoxy. But at this point, we might have to say, okay, we don't want to succumb to perfectionist fallacy. You know, we know there are weak, bad shepherds out there that have been given stewardship over a diocese. What we need to do as give them as much pushback as we can, and that should at least center them. Because right now, the bad guys are fully in charge. They are driving the buggy, and we need sure. to stop it. But we're not we're not Hegelians, and, and again, like <laughs> the, we we already saw. I mean, the, the the dialectic doesn't adequately describe history, and yeah. it is a top down pyramidal structure in the church that you're just, I think, uh, all, candidly. Um, and I, I agree with with what you're saying to do, but I'd say it's it's the less important uh, uh, expedient to take. It doesn't address the main problem. It's a top down yeah. church. If you have a bunch of gays running around, it's because it's been christened by I agree exactly. structure. So I agree. Let's yeah. can I be clear? I am in full agreement with that. But the fact is, we since it is top down, we have to acknowledge that the framework under which we're laboring, right? So we can't, you know have a coup d'etat, not, and of course, not, I'm not talking like violently, I'm talking about um, just allegorically here. We can't really have a coup, we can't vote bishops out of office who are bad, right? So we have to do what we can, our part is the lady. And it's not enough just to be like, okay, we need to, we do need to pray for good bishops, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to cleanse and purify his and church. And Pope Francis, but, I don't think you're going to get them. Right, so we have to do what we can, is what I'm saying. I'm there has to be a game plan. Can, can I tell you what I've done? Because on this issue, I mean, I, I've, been gra- well, I've been grappling with it my whole life, you know, since I was molested. But, um, I mean, for 20 years with the Catholic Church, and what I have found, you know, James mm-hmm. Martin talks about LGBT people being on the margins of the church. That's not true. They are not in the margins of the church. They're at the very center of the church. They're at the heart of the church right now, Okay. Yeah. Um, where the margins are is where the truth is. That's that's on the margins. Because when I came back to the church in 99, I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I went into one of these parishes with the rainbow flag. 
because I kind of figured, you know, they would understand me. But when I talked to the priest, you know, he was like trying to turn me out. He was like trying to get me to meet somebody at the parish because he had a group of gay men at the parish. It was like a social group, but it was also like a dating group, too. Yeah. And, and these are all, all yeah, these I parishes. And I don't want to get into the weird stuff that's going on in these groups because, because I've told the particular bishop, and I said, I think that's where the future of a lot of these lawsuits are going to be. Because a lot of these people that run these ministries are employees of the diocese and the archdiocese. Okay? So they're going to be liable for all this stuff. Financially liable for the things that are going on. But anyway, I got so tired of these, these priests telling me that uh, homosexual activity was not a sin, that I should, you know, try to settle down with one guy, that I shouldn't be ashamed, yada, yada. The church is going to change. One day you'll get married in the church. I, I heard it all. I heard it all. I ended up, and I end, but there's no accidents in life. Um, because I was ready to bail on the Catholic Church. I was so sick of it. I, I hated the liturgy. The liturgy was just like when I was a kid. It was the St. Louis Jesuits. It was Simon and Garfunkel. It was like everybody come around the altar and join hands during the, the consecration. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. So, so I, ended up, I ended up in the, in the Latin mass community. And let me tell you, in 1999... They weren't easy to find. This is for the adult. And I didn't know what the Latin mass was. I didn't know what Latin was. All I knew Latin was is the smart kids studied Latin in school. I, I didn't know anything. But I went and I ended up going to these priests for confession. I was like, finally, a priest I can trust, a priest I'm not afraid of. And on the mar that was the margins of the Catholic Church, and it still is. And that's right. where I have found... The truth, and I just stay there, because when you get into the church, when you get into these dioceses, and when you try to talk to the bishops, the realization that I have found is that I cannot do anything. I can pray for these people. I've suffered for these people. But in terms of like something concrete, having them do something, they won't do it. They won't do it. So like LGBT yeah. people that I know that you know, I don't know many that want to come to the church, but I said, let me hand walk you to a parish that I know the priest is not right. going to, is not going to abuse you and, it, and is not going to try to deceive you. And that's what you have to do. You just have to do it one by one by one. And that's what I've done. I can't wait for the bishops to get their act together. I mean, there is courage which is a good group, and, I, and I've had a 20-year involvement with that group. But the, the bishops don't support it, and mm -hmm. a lot of times in dioceses, the priests do not support it. I mean, in San Francisco, I cannot tell people where the Courage meeting takes place. I cannot tell them. Why? There's because a lot of know. different reasons. Well, they're, 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 they're scared of uh, protesters or something getting in, or people's identity being revealed. But if I can't tell people where to get help, what do I do? What right. do I, it's very difficult. To well, the, church, the church attacks its sons. You know, we used to say at, uh, when I went to Gregorian, it was so hard to even get registered for classes. All the, the Irish and English priests told me, Mother Greg eats her children. It's an old expression there when I was just getting registered and my, my Italian was still inchoate. But it is, this is what it is. It's. I mean, I, I look at you. I mean, when I when I was reading the passages here, uh, Joseph, I just think of. I, I mean, God bless you, man. You're, you're a good man. Uh, you know, trying. You know, with this plea from the heart, cry from the heart to 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 do the right thing and to, you know, like, as you did decades ago, claw your way out of a, yeah. a a bad a bad way, and just look for some spiritual parentage, and we. Um, you, on this issue, me, the, all yeah, of us, we're all orphans. I mean, no. I'm like that monk that every day was like, you know what? Today I'm going to leave the monastery. Or no, I'll try to get through today in the monastery, right. and I'll leave tomorrow. And then he would say that again. I, that's every day. Every day I'm like, gosh, I went out of this church. I, I just went out. And I, and I went so far as to start instruction in the Russian Orthodox Church. I couldn't take it. They've got problems in the Russian Orthodox Church, but they don't have the, they don't have the gay problem. 
Yeah. So, uh, and I didn't want this one anymore. I'm tired of it. I'm just so sick of it. Yeah, I think it's, we all are. Honestly, it's I, super I've heard bad. that no, when you just show an ordinary heterosexual male a picture of two men making like intimate contact, whether through a kiss or a handhold, it automatically like raises their adrenaline. We are sick of it. It's disgusting. It's despicable. We don't want it thrown in our face anymore. And, and like you said, Joseph, this is an extreme minority within the Catholic Church. The gay population is 2%, right? right. So to, to think that and within the Catholic Church, it's going to be even lower because, of course, there's this anti-magnetism not among between the homosexuals, not, among, not among the clergy. The clergy. I'm talking yeah. about in the, the pew-sitting rank and file, oh, you know, very, they're, very. Are, they're repelled by Catholic doctrine. They're, but they're so even among the general population, there's only 2% homosexual um, population. Within the Catholic Church, that's bound to be even a little lower. So it's not like this is a real big uh, problem by the numbers in the Catholic laity and the amount of propaganda, the amount of quote ministries that we have dedicated to homosexuality in the church, it's far overrepresented. You know, homosexuality is far overrepresented because of the clergy, the exactly. right? Because, because of the clergy. But it's the elephant in the room people don't want to talk about. I, I right. said I said this over ten years ago. I said in the twenty first century, the issue that is going to define the Catholic Church is not abortion. And people looked at me like I was nuts. I said it's the homosexual issue. I said there are very few priests and bishops who have had an abortion. There's a whole bunch of them that I'm being sarcastic that are gay and practicing. And they're and they're and well. Dr. Marshall was right about infiltration. People kind of thought he was nuts, too. But it's true. It no, I is, said that too. And I've seen it with my own two eyes. Let right. me tell you. Let me tell you. I've, I, I know groups of gay priests that are act. I, I just, I know it. I Joseph, know. I've said, I've made the exact same point. Uh, people will, uh, because the abortion issue isn't as uh, utterly important as it is. Sure it is. is not, it's not a litmus test for the prelates, for the prelates, bishop, archbishop, cardinals, uh, the clergy, even the lower priests, because they're not, they're not making anyone mad. It's the, you're absolutely right. It's the gay issue. Where are you on this, up or down? It's the litmus test. Abortion, because they don't really care. The, the, the secret is, well, these are these are wicked men, right? Who have seized power and are, are are you know from the seat of power, they're directing the rest of us to kind of do their bidding and, and, and at their leisure. So they don't really care about the faithful anyway. They couldn't care less no. about us. No. So yeah, Dave's absolutely right in in terms of you know homosexuals uh, or, or SSA or whatever you want to call it attending uh, given church a given sunday mass is probably you and maybe one other guy that's ever struggled with this they don't need all those ministries the ministries are for the priests presumably to meet it's a meat club right it's propaganda to it's evangelizing it's, people it's with the a, culture of homosexuality right it's actually evangelizing the culture and normalizing homosexuality yeah. under the guise of kind of having a ministry dedicated to accompaniment or even like stamping out homosexuality. And one more point, that with celibacy, homosexuality is the anti-celibacy. Think about it like that. You know, not heterosexual relations. Homosexuality is in a particular way an attack on the priesthood because it's anti-celibate. It's not just uncelibate like uh, heterosexuality. So it's, it actually is the best marker of the anti-church. It's celibacy, yeah. like we've recently seen by um, Benedict the Sixteenth and Cardinal yeah. Sarah, is really integral to the priesthood. The the tell of this new anti-church springing up is going to be a commitment to homosexualism. Yeah, can, can I make two points too? Also, a lot of these priests, and I don't want to say the ministries, but a lot of these priests and bishops who support these type of ministries don't really care about LGBT people, because, um, okay, look at, okay, I'll just say his name, look at James Martin, in his, because I've gone to several of his talks, and he said, you know, the church should celebrate and support people to come out as God created them, as they were born to be, and all this stuff, and, but he won't do it, he won't do it, he won't take that risk, 
and come out because he was, you got to hand it to the gays. The, a gay newspaper in San Francisco interviewed him and asked him the question outright, what are you? And yeah. he refused to answer. But he pushes all of these young people who have same-sex attraction to come out, be open, be honest about the right. way God created you. They use LGBT people. He did that at the LA Rec, at the, the one talk I did. There was a man there, he was from Canada, he's gay, he's also married to his same-sex partner, and he was let go at a parish, and the, the story is complicated, but he was let go after he became very open about his, his same-sex marriage, and he was speaking at different events, and he was let go. Well, Martin had this man there, and he talked about the man's plight, and, and the, the homophobic Catholic Church had him stand up and everybody applauded. He used this particular man to make a point. He won't, he won't do it him, himself. The, and the, so they don't care. If, if they truly cared about the LGBT community, they would say, okay, this is what the Catholic Church teaches. Difficult. You might not like it. But here it is. Accept it or move on. And is he gay? What, and that's what I, who, James Martin? James Martin, can I you have, confirm? I, I have no idea. I have okay. no idea. I have no idea. I don't really want to know. But um, that's what I do. I tell people, hey, this is what the Catholic Church teaches. The Anglican Church, you can go get married. But this is what the cat. And some people are attracted to that. Some people have been burned out. Some people have been abused. Some people are sick and tired of the gay life. So it, it is attractive to them. But just give them the choice. Don't play all this deception game about the church is going to change, the church is developing on this issue. Uh, one of these people at the LA Rec who ran the booth said, the church's position on homosexuality is in transition. That's what he said. So, but number, and, but number two also, I think, what a lot of these ministers do and what a lot of this rhetoric in the church about born gay and God made you gay and all this stuff, I think it's grooming future victims because the priest who actually yeah. abused me, that was the line he was using with me, which was God made you gay and it's okay. So I think they're, they're setting up people to be abused and not even know it and not even realize it. And they'll, it's the perfect victim because right. they're telling these people that God made them gay, that it's okay. And that, it, you know, and then a priest sexually abuses you but you don't realize that it's any kind of abuse because it's just the way that god created you right. and that's the way i thought for a long time because a lot of these kids are already at a loss and then you've got a priest or a ministry and at the la rec you've got catholic educators there and they're t and they, it was very sick to me it really offended me is they actually, it was kind of like a blueprint on how to abuse a child. They're telling you to event, identify a vulnerable kid, let's say a boy, maybe a feminine, doesn't have a lot of male friends, isn't sporty, is artistic, is hanging around the girls. Identify that child, confirm them in their homosexuality, and then support them. Wow. Yes, wow. that's what they were doing. And I'm like, boy, that's the same Sick. kind of thing that worked with me. They're like setting up children to be abused and it's like i said it's the perfect victim because these people like me will never even realize that they had been abused it's grooming them right because exactly. what you really should do with a boy like that is be like here's a strong male role model look at look at how he's living his life look at the the attraction to this way of life to this manliness and i want you to embrace this manliness and i want you to look at exemplars of this and who are really going to teach you by example how to be a man how to well, live virtuously um awesome. this your masculinity and that's how you should do it it's not by you know obviously grooming them and, and pushing them more towards embracing the effeminacy of the homosexual lifestyle well they were even telling um, edu Catholic educators at the LA Rec to, event of, to identify and support people, children who are identifying as transgender. That's right. what they were doing that. As satanic, well. man. It's and satanic. No, and, and they had a, you know, a, a lovely person. I talked to them later, completely confused. But they had a person there who was transgender, and they gave their testimony.
about how wonderful it was to transition from one gender to the other and how the Catholic Church should support that and Catholic teachers should support that. And um, this is what's going on at the L.A. Rec. That's why I get kind of annoyed with Catholics and Christians sometimes who get all in a fear about drag queen story hour. Okay, you know, that is not a great thing at all. But you've got it going on in the Catholic Church. you got a drag right. queen story hour right at the L.A. Rec. And it's very targeted. It's not just the parents, you know, bringing their kids. It's Catholic educators. They know right. where to go. They know exactly. Where to, yeah. They're, they're and doing the bishop, it. And what do the bishops do? Nothing. You know, Bishop Barron walks around there grinning like nothing's wrong. You know, come on. Come on. Hey, let's show them some muscle. Let's have some retrogrades. Do some civil disobedience. Unplug a few microphones. You know, go to this and make a stink. Show up with signs. Show up and, and shout down some of these evil speakers. You don't have a right to go and indoctrinate the sheep of the they church. Will turn, they will turn foul. it against you and you'll be labeled homophobic. And look at these, Whatever. these look at these traditional rigid Catholics. Yeah. yeah. And look what's yeah. happened to Boris. Look what's happened to Boris. Because Boris went and did this in Orlando yeah. and they won't dialogue with him. They usher him out. They see him out. The the power is behind look, the church is divine, but these churchmen of this this age, the guys in power are really, really wicked. I mean the majority of them are really it doesn't really matter whether your father stands idly by and watches someone abuse you and he doesn't do it himself, or he grooms you to be abused and he doesn't do it himself, or he abuses you himself. I mean, this is the most tawdry, feckless, vile, disgusting era of the, the churchmen. I think of most the of the bishops in the United States should resign, with just a yeah. few exceptions. They're, they're just so tainted. they're so tainted. How do you work with them? They're Again. so dirty. They, yeah. Do, yes. do, do, do you want to know something? I went to a bishop. I went to a bishop and I said, I said, this is, and I'm always polite with them. I said, Your Excellency, this is what's going on in, the di in, in this particular parish and with this pastor. You really need to do something about it. You know what he did? He set me up with a meeting with the pastor. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, that's horrible. That's... I was horrified. I felt, I, felt like, I felt like an abuse victim happened to go talk to the priest that abused me. Yeah. Without a bailiff there in between you. you just... I was like, oh my God, what is he doing? He, this is the problem that he needs to take care of. This priest is part of the problem, is a big part of the problem. And he wants me to go speak with him. Yeah. Ooh, we're not going to solve it here today. I, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I like... <laughs> I like the idea of creating a stink, you know, um, Steph, my wife was saying this too. Yeah, we should, we should go to the religious education conference and do, do like what Dave's saying, protest some, because I've done the, the pamphleting thing. Yeah. Have you, yeah. You know, that, that matters some, maybe a little more, a little more muscle in it, but ultimately it, we will be with this. We are the sons in the household with a drunken naked father, you know, diocese to diocese that's, that's running around. You can try to do damage control, and try to tell your little brother, you know, oh, don't, don't, don't listen to dad, whatever. But we, look, we are, we are, stick with the church, you know, Joseph Chambra, good for you for sticking with the church. Grin and bear it, because it's the one true faith. This is what I do every day. But the the liturgies are bad, the, the priests are bad, oh. the, you know, the, the bishops are off, you know, in an ivory tower. The there's nothing the except the deposit of faith, and, and that's enough to sustain us, and the sacraments. And the, that's church is in, the church is in the catacombs right now. That's where you literally have to go. And when I went to the TLM mass in 99, it was in the catacombs. Wow. That's where, that's where it was. That's where it was. It's, yeah. it's difficult. And, and you know, I got to drive an hour for a, a Latin mass. People, Catholics, just got to do it. You know, yeah. I ain't going to the parishes in my town. I ain't going, I ain't giving them money. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. No, but since there's a lot of naive people because I and trusting people. One of the saddest letters I ever got was from a mother, um, and um, she had a son that was SSA that had same sex attraction, and it was a typical story. Dad wasn't in the picture, blah blah blah. So she talked to the the pastor at the parish, and he said, "Oh, gee, by the way, I have an LGBT ministry at my parish. Let your son." come to the ministry so that son was involved with that he came out with a, a few months later with a boyfriend and an lgbt activist that's what happened 
That's what yeah. happened to that young man. And the mother's broken hearted. Yeah. So much of LGBT ministry, it's it's perverse because good Catholics are going to assume, oh, it's ministry, like it's telling them not to be LGBT. It's telling them how to fight these disordered inclinations, right? But what they really mean by it is it's ministering to them by applauding this uh, evil alternative lifestyle. So it's not a ministry in the sense that like Christ came to preach repentance to sinners. It's a ministry of affirmation. So don't be duped. And what the other thing, I just want to double down on what Tim said earlier, because this is the point, and I think this is kind of the diabolical plot behind all of this. It's to part good Catholics from the church by dispiriting them. <laughs> It's trying to show us that there's no place in the church for us. The prevalence of all the yeah. nonsense and the heterodoxy and the heteropraxy, it's bad guys. And it's truly Satan at the top because this is the he knows he can't attack the church and get it to preach false doctrine you know, infallibly. He knows he can't add to the deposit of faith or make the church contradict her deposit of faith. So if you're the devil and you know you're bound in those ways, then yeah. how are you going to attack the church? How are you going to rip the church of Christ apart? It's going to be by dispiriting the faithful, making them want to leave, making the liturgy, yeah, banal and insipid and lifeless. Even though those graces are there in the liturgy, it's going to make the liturgy appear to be very earthly and worldly as opposed to heavenly and beautiful. It's going to be uh, try to make Catholic teaching on sexuality appear to be something that's base and ugly and repulsive when actually true sexuality is a beautiful and godly thing and so there's going to be that sort of attack and that's what we're witnessing so people it's what um what was it cardinal burke that said it stay faithful no matter what happens no matter what comes down the pike stay faithful to the church it doesn't matter you know don't start becoming don't become a set of vicantists or start dabbling with these kooky, like, extra church ideologies, you know? Stay in the church and just rough it, even though it's going to be a slog, even though you're going to see things that are going to dispirit you, because this devil is trying to get you to despair, and you have to resist that, and it's going to take discipline, because it's disgusting and despicable when we have to see iconography depicting Christ as gay, and you see the bishops not, you know, striking this down, but giving little winks to it by having the artists who painted such, you know, arch blasphemy, it, having them incorporated into diocesan affairs. That hurts us. It hurts my heart. But stay faithful. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Joseph Chambra. Yeah, that's is, that is great. That, 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 that wrapped up the show well. Yeah. And, if we've learned anything from like the McCarrick case or the Me Too movement, you do not have to be a minor in order to be sexually abused. And there's sexual abuse going on right now, homosexual sexual abuse going on right now in the Catholic Church, and I know it. But these are adults, and they don't want to come forward because they do not believe they've been abused. But they've been manipulated and sexually abused by priests and bishops in the Catholic Church. Yeah, it's especially relevant in the Church where, again, we, we have the concept of spiritual parentage, and spiritual incest, right? When your spiritual father, your parish priest, or your bishop is molesting you, this is spiritual incest. I think this is Taylor Marshall's term. And there is a kind of control happening, even if it's a, a person older than 18, even if they've attained their majority. Um, yeah, uh, Me Too is uh, another issue altogether, but that's, that's, that's true. I, that was the I, one I, takeaway I took from that movement, is that, you know, a lot of people think in order to be sexually abused, you have to be a minor. No, someone of age can be sexually abused. They can be manipulated and sexually abused. Again, it comes down to how seriously do we take the, the real ontological mark on the souls of the shepherds, the, the princes of the church, the bishops, and and they're they're you know deputized uh, they're, they're deputies the, the the presbyters the priests if they are really our fathers then yes they are going to answer for all of this they're and dead feet yes fathers. yeah and the, the, it is abuse you're you're right I used to I'm not sure if I'm there with adults with me too because you want a job I, I'm not sure I can get there with you but there is something to it well but as but, a but in father. the church it's peculiar. Because, and I know I, we've gone over, 
but they're they're predators are are uh, very are very smart, and they know they can't go after the miners anymore. So they've adjusted, and they and people who are in the LGBT community a lot of times are damaged people. And, you know, over seventy percent of gay men were, were molested as children, and these yeah. are the kind of people that they go after. These are vulnerable people. Joseph Schomburg, thanks, thanks for being with us. Everyone, God um, bless you, oh. God thanks, bless you man. Keep, keep the struggle. I admire your struggle. There's a lot of palpable suffering in even just the, the chapter or two I read of your book. And just, just stick with it, man. Like, like Dave said, you're a good man. Just, just stick with it. And uh, this is what we're all doing in different ways. For some people, it's SSA. For other people, it's I just can't bear the thought of a rainbow flag during a liturgy. I can't bear the thought of a lot that happens during this liturgy. This June, but, it will be happening. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Pride. Well, Disordered is the book. And um, we, yeah, we want to we want to encourage people to subscribe to hit the like, the, the bell. Um, please, we will put all of our information as we always do. Twitter, Twitter handles, Patreon accounts. Uh, um, Joseph will have your information up there, too. Also, by an act of a force majeure, an act of heaven. Uh, we have, uh, you see behind Dave, the rules for retrogrades is out. You got one behind me. People are getting their copies early. It's uh, uh, Easter's come early this year. Uh, also, we'd like to give a shout out to Right Edge Magazine for doing a short profile of our show, Rules for Retrogrades. Uh, they're big on uh, following rule one and staying on offense by publishing conservative content, conservative arguments, and the evidence to back them up, more importantly. Feel free to visit their website and check them out on Facebook, Right Edge Magazine. Also, thank you to Immaculate Scent and Soap Company. We'd like to kick our shouts out to them. And uh, I'd like to put my your patrons... Fine smelling on. and holy. Yes, yeah, fine smelling, holy, and you're supporting good Catholic uh, local industry. My patrons, I just wanted to say, I have uh, the second lecture of the church history course uploaded, and, and we've also moved that down in terms of pay category, so it's it's for everyone. So church history and Aristotle are going to be available. Um, that'll be next at a much lower level than it was before. But um, Joseph, thank, thanks very much for your hour 15, and people, thanks for watching. God bless you all, and uh, God bless your, your continuing ministry, Joseph Schomber. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Joseph. Tim, I'll see you later. Peace. <laughs> see you right hey, now. Hey, thank you, Tim. God bless you. <laughs>